Mark Bird. <laughs> we met a little over one year ago in Jerusalem at the Commonwealth of Israel, where I was speaking during the Jer Jerusalem Jubilee. <laughs> and he's been doing the same work. And since then, we have got him as one of the coordinators of the Commonwealth of Israel. And him and his wife, Cindy, are doing a great work down in Prescott, Arizona, with their ministry, which is called Torah One New Man. This is their logo here. And then Global Ministries. And I encourage you to look at their website at TorahOneNewMan.org. And he's doing a beautiful work, and we are organizing a conference next spring yes. in February, which will be for the spreading of awareness of both houses of Israel coming back together and reconciling. And what Christians need to do is they recognize their descendants of Israel to present themselves to Judah without the pagan garb. And what Judah needs to do to recognize that there is a lot more of Israel than just is in Israel today. Mm -hmm. They have yep. a beautiful excerpt on their website that I'd like to share with you that kind of sums up their ministry. Mark wrote, the message of the Bible is all about reconciliation. First, God's reconciliation to man by the redemption through Yeshua. And then, man reconciling with other man, just like we're reconciling with our brother Judah. Israel and Judah through his agape love. We are called to be ambassadors in this reconciliation process. The Bible states that Jew and Gentile will come together as one new man in Ephesians 2.15 and abolish the veil that, of hostility that has been between them for the last 2,700 and about 40 years. It's all about the love of God manifesting in and among us during these last days of this age to become a family of the one true God. Unity among the brethren is required to bring the anointing and fire of God, according to Psalms 133. Father God wants reconciliation to take place all around the world. And this is exactly what Torah One New Man Global Ministries is all about. Do you know the Shekinah glory ascended and left this earth when Israel was divided? And it's not until Israel comes back together that the glory of God will fall upon Jerusalem once again. So we invite our brother thank Mark you. from Arizona, and we thank, thank you for being here. Thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Here. I'm going to set my books down for a few minutes so I have a little more room. And we can walk, we can walk through this. I want to uh, definitely thank my dear friend Rabbi Yitzhak in Jerusalem last year, 2017, at the Commonwealth of Israel second conference. I believe it was the first time ever in Israel the year before that there was a conference on Judah recognizing the house of Ephraim returning. And my wife Cindy and I were there the year before and met people and asked us to come back the next year and sit at this round table that had never been performed before or got together. And so we did return in 2016 for the first conference and the next one in 2017. And when I listened to Rabbi Yitzhak talk, the Lord says, you need to go up and make a connection with him. And so that's what I did. I pretty just says, here we are. We've traveled halfway around the world almost to come. We need to ha meet this and make this friendship between us. And so we just talked several times. And after we returned home, well, before we returned home, I asked Rabbi where he lived, and he said Wenatchee. My wife and I are from Seattle. We just moved 14 years ago, so we're already pretty close. Coming to Washington isn't foreign to us. We've been over here many times in our lives. But then we talked, and we got to see each other then in October last year, just a few months later. Like and then, the same heart. Same heart, yes. <laughs> and we came up. I came up a few weeks ago or so to meet uh, and listen to Dr. Spikerman talk again. And then my wife and I have come back again. So there's definitely a, a connection there between us that the Father wants us to reconcile with. You know, and when I met Rabbi in, in Israel is that he's from the house of Judah. And I'm from the house of Ephraim. And there are, I never see any conflict between us because it's recognized, scripture is written, and Rabbi recognizes the house of Israel's returning. And so this is a phenomenal event that's happening in our lifetimes today. You know, so I did want to share about, before I get into this, because I'm not going to talk about all of the, all of the dispersion or the regathering, but I do want to start with 
it is the month of Elul and the king is in the field, then it's a time for us to come closer together. And that the astrical sign in the heavens is Virgo, and it's the scales of justice that goes on at this time. You know, and for myself, try to share about the constellations that are written in the heavens is because the story is written up there from the beginning to the end. The heavens declare his glory. And when we learn how to read the signs that are written up there, we can see what's going on. And so with the scales of justice is a very important time, I believe, in this month for us that we not only repent for what we've done, but repent for what we haven't done. And when I share and get emotional like this is because it's the Spirit of God that comes over me and says how much He loves you, how much He cares for you, and wants you to, they're saying I need to speak louder. <laughs> okay, I'll try to speak louder. I'm a pretty, I'm pretty quiet person, but <laughs> I'll try to speak up. <laughs> they're going like this. <laughs> that is how much He loves us that He wants us to return to Him. So, with that part of the uh, message said, let's just go look and, and start right here with our, with our logo. You know, there's a meaning behind this, and I, and I want to share about Ty and Tamara Lamb that are our dear friends in Prescott, Arizona, that help us deeply with our ministry, and, and Ty designed this for us. And so when we look at this, we can, we'll just start with the outside of the Torah, which is written right here in the Word of God. So our two Torah scrolls are the Word of God. The two olive branches coming together is Ezekiel 37, that when the house of Judah and the house of Israel return, then God will make them one. And we can see them joined together right here. As we look at this globe, because it's all around the world that this is occurring, is that right there is Israel. Beautiful. Right in the center of the globe. Mm -hmm. So it has a meaning, not just a picture that may look nice and wonderful and feel good for you, but there's a deeper meaning when we reach into this. So that is the Torah, is the one new man that uh, Ephesians talks about, but it is also, it's the two houses coming together to be the one new man, because a house divided cannot stand. My get out of jail card tonight is that you don't have to agree. <laughs> I'm not an expert. I'm, all, I'm doing what the Father's called me to do and stepping out and answering that call around the world. And so I encourage people, if you have a question or comment, to go ahead and get in and jump in with this. And I'll do the best I can. If I don't know the answer, I'm not going to tell you something I don't know. The purpose of this teaching is to take you on a journey of belief, trust, and understanding of scriptural prophecy being fulfilled today with the return of the house of Israel and reconciliation with the house of Judah as called out believers and the new ones coming to life to take a look at this approach. Because I believe that there's a, there's a message out here today that the Father is calling billions of us back home and I believe that there's so many people today that don't recognize it that the Spirit of God is stirring in them and they have they don't know what the answer is they're seeking but they don't know what it is that will quench the thirst I, I use that that term quench the thirst like like you have an itch but you don't know where to scratch it and so God's calling you and until someone like myself or someone else comes around to share this word, it doesn't get activated. But once it gets activated, you can never go back. When I mean never go back, you can never go back to the way that you've been taught and understood that God is calling you out of Egypt. He's calling you out of Babylon. He's calling you out to come back home to the one true God and, know, and learn and understand what that meaning is. So Rabbi introduced us with our, um, with our uh, brief piece here. And everybody, we, we tried to get everybody a handout for more about, uh, more about us because I want you to know about this before I go into all of my message is that on your handout here is uh, 
what we do is, is study groups to prepare travel for Israel because we like to take small groups with us so that when you're there the land comes alive and how do we do that we do it through the Hebrew alphabet through word pictures and relevant scripture references how do the 12 tribes of Israel from 2700 years ago relate to us today and why did Yeshua say in Matthew 15 that he came only for the lost sheep of Israel? We want to share about the differences in the biblical Hebrew and the Roman calendars, the seven biblical feasts, differences between Hebrew and, and Greek mindset, and Old Testament Bible prophecy that's being fulfilled today. You know, when I looked at when we look at this, is that for a new believer coming out is like what is the first thing that we usually do when we start hearing what God is doing today around the world and it, it's usually by become by observing the seven biblical feasts that's usually probably the first sign that you'll start to want to do maybe you sit in church and you go how come Easter isn't lining up with Passover how come Easter is always on Sunday and Passover is on Wednesday or a Tuesday or a Monday or Shabbat, a different day? It makes us think God is stirring inside of you something that hasn't been activated before. That's usually the first sign that you're being called out. That was for me. And then once that happened, the next sign is that I start wanting to observe Shabbat. So I practiced observing Shabbat. And then, because of my curiosity, I want to learn more, so I start learning about the Torah Parashah, the reading every week. And I start reading that every week. And as we go along, we start coming out of the harlot and coming into His true word that's written in all your Bibles. Huh? The Hebrew Scriptures start coming alive in your Bible. So that's part of us, and we wanted to, I wanted to share on that so that we can look at who we are. I, I must have touched no, something. I, I did. I oh, okay. <laughs> Before we get into that part two, let's look at this, because this is, this is so important for us. Both Rabbi and I were, and I think others might have been in here, might have been last year in Jerusalem to the, first, to the second Koi conference. And when I came home last year, I thought, what can I, I have to do something here to get this conference bigger than it is in Jerusalem. Because there, there weren't that many people, maybe a hundred people from around the world that came and go, this is such an activation that's going on in the world today that more people need to know about it. So Rabbi and I talked about this and said, why don't we have our own conference? And as Rabbi Yitzhak is a board member of the Commonwealth of Israel, and I'm a coordinator, said, let's do it ourselves. Let's start it here in America. So that's what, th that's what this is. It is the Commonwealth of Israel. That is, our, that is our covering that we're underneath. And in February 17th and 18th of next year, we're going to do a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, bringing together the descendants of Judah and Israel so that we can have our speakers talk about what it looks like to get us together. Because the Father calls us together. He talks about the prodigal son. He tells us in Ezekiel that when they come together, he'll make them one. But how do we get to that point? How do we get to that reconciliation? And how, what's it going to look like for Judah to recognize us, for us to ask Judah for forgiveness for what we've done and what we haven't done? and bring that together because I, I saw this in Israel a few years ago and in, in the last couple of years is that when we're there they don't recognize us if, 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 if I didn't wear a kippah tonight and tzitzit you wouldn't recognize me as being part of the house of Israel so there it's not to dress like them it's to be it's to be what they do and observe in scripture so that we become like them because it's for everyone Right? The scripts were written for everyone. And I'll get to this in a little while later today because not all of Israel is Jewish. Just Judah and Benjamin. And the others are the northern kingdom. It's you guys out there. 
that's being called home and wanting to get back to what what the father told the Israelites leaving Egypt at Mount Sinai they were all together all of the Hebrews that were leaving and all the foreigners all the sojourners everybody that came is for everyone and I take I thank Judah for all these years of keeping everything together for us because I know it wasn't easy and it wouldn't ever be something that I would want to try to do because I can't do it I wasn't raised that way right but it's his heart that's calling us back home so it, you know I encourage anybody that, that that's interested in this out wherever you're at to get a hold of us so that you can see what God is doing on the earth today and this little conference in Phoenix is building up to the bigger conference in Jerusalem which is just a couple months later on Shavuot mm -hmm. in 2019 right yes we have some here Here's one here, and we have more. And, and it is, it leads up to Shavuot next year in Jerusalem. And that's where you can come and see other people from around the world that are being called out. And the house of Judah starts recognizing more of us wanting to come home. That's all I want to do is go home. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that is a applause right there. <laughs> so... That shares the that shares uh, about the conference and some of us. I've I've written my list here of, of how to go through this, and I want to start off tonight with thanking Ty and Tamara Lamb, our dear friends, and and maybe this is for you, and maybe it's not. But Ty Lamb wrote up a list of distinctive signs indicators markers features traits that you are being called out and separated by the holy spirit in these days and i want to just share some of this maybe it's for some people in here and maybe it's for others out in other parts of the world you are growing dissatisfied with your present church and you're not sure why maybe this speaks to you or not just think about them you're having difficulty finding a church to connect with. You find that your private devotional time richer than your church life. You feel that traditional holidays such as Christmas and Easter are out of sync or less fulfilling and you don't know why. You find yourself reading and studying the Old Testament more and more. You've begun to realize that adherence to Old Testament ways are not about legalism. They're about learning to live obedient, holy, and pleasing lives to the Father. You have a hunger or fascination with searching your family roots. You've been on a Holy Land trip and you've walked where Yeshua walked and you are longing to be able to go on such a trip. Your ears perk up, perk up when you hear about Israel in the news. You admit that you're pro-Israel and approve an independent state of Israel. Those are just a few of the, of the things on his list. You know, questions, thoughts to, for you to think about. Is this you? Are these things going on in your life? That might be part of the quenching of that thirst that needs to get answered because the Father's doing something remarkable in the world today, and many people don't know what it is, how to get out what that is that he's calling us on. So, with that said, this is, our, this is my foundational teaching that when I'm in a place that I can share with, that I teach on. It's a very beginning. It's about 10 hours long, so I hope you brought a <laughs> pillow with you today. <laughs> Okay, we're not going to, but we're going to look at this. And it starts off with the returning to the original, returning to the Father, restoration of all things. It is a teaching series guiding you in a circular motion. It covers Pardes, the name of God, seven days of creation, God's calendar of time, tribes of Israel, Torah parashah readings, prophecy has that has been fulfilled, and your part in the kingdom to come. Because you have a part too. And when we're called out, for me, we need to answer that call. Because what are we seeking? Are we seeking for his kingdom to come? Amen. 
that's what the Lord's Prayer is about, then we need to be a part of it so that it can happen. And we won't share the whole 10 hours today, but I wanted to let you know what our foundational teaching is so that we can go through this. Some years ago, uh, some people laid hands on me in different places over the years and gave me this scripture. Conf confirmation from different sources in different states. And this is our foundational belief here in Torah One New Man is Isaiah 58 and 12. And they that are yours will build up the old waste places. You will raise up the foundations of many generations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Hmm. That's my belief today is what I've been called to do is, is that brokenness that's in the family, in our own homes, but also the brokenness of the two houses of the house of, De of Judah and the house of Israel need to be repaired. That breach has to be broken. And the restore of the past to dwell is how do we get there? How do we get down that path for that to happen? And so when I, when I started, I tried to let you all know that we're going to talk about uh, faith, trust, and understanding on how to get to this place. So I felt like we should start with a, he, a Hebrew mindset versus a Greek mindset. Because most of us, being Westerners, have been raised up with a Greek mindset that we don't even know. It's a whole different way that we look at it than from a Hebrew mindset or a, a, a Eastern mindset. And so a couple of them to start with is Hebrew faith is relational and Greek faith is rational. Have you been raised when you read your Bible to have a relationship with the Father? Or do you read it trying to rationalize what was, is written? trying to understand because we really don't understand what it looks like when the Father is all about relationship. How do we get to that place of faith being relational? And so I've got a couple I've got a couple uh, examples here to share with you that we can look at. Greek, hate, Greek mindset is chance plus cause and effect limit what can happen and Hebrew causes everything and God causes everything in his universe. It's not by happenstance, it's that he causes everything. And trying to, I'm trying to get us to look at this with a different point of view. Greek, linear time divided into neat segments. Each event is new. Hebrew, cyclical or spiraling time. Similar events constantly reoccur. I think about the, this linear time frame that are put into neat little segments because the Word of God says there was evening and morning. It doesn't say there were 24 hours. It doesn't say that there were 60 minutes in an hour. It doesn't say there were 60 seconds in a minute. It got divided into these neat little segments that are controlling your life today. I would be willing to bet that almost everybody in here Time is, con is controlling your life. We have to be here at this time. It's time to go. When will we see each other again? Oh, well, how about if we have lunch at 12.15 next week? All these little segments. God, man divided this up and wrote them into little segments to start controlling your life. Otherwise, if we were just living by evening and daylight, when I see Rabbi today and we say, hey, let's have lunch next third day of the week. And what's that time? He goes, how about, how about noon? I go, okay. So we'll watch the sun to see what time it is. We already know what the day is because we know there's evening and day. We already know what day of week it is because we're Sabbath observant and begin on the first day of the week. So we don't have a car and I don't have a donkey and he does so I better start trucking because it's going to take me a while to get there but he'll wait for me because I don't have to be there right at high noon it'll be close enough in that time frame to meet 
So man divides it up into little segments, and God has it reoccur over and over. Just over and over, evening and morning. And with that occurrence over and over is that we can start learning how what Judah does and trying to put it into our lives by praying three times a day because it's daily prayer. So there, there's, this is an example of seven days of creation. It's one day is our daily prayer. And the second day is the Sabbath because it's a week. So we, every week, we comes around, here comes the Sabbath. And then the third day will be the new moon, because every month is a new moon. So we're learning how to keep track of time, right? The fourth one is the feast, because they're yearly. So they come around every, we can count on it. Here it comes, if we're looking ahead, right? The next one is the Shemitah, because it happens every, every seven years. And the sixth one is the Jubilee, because it happens every 50 years. What's the next one? It's okay. <laughs> it's the millennial. Yes. So this is a time occurrence that continually happens. This is a whole different way of thinking outside of the Western world of Greek. This is what I'm trying to share when we, we look at these, these thoughts here. Okay, so uh, Greek is oriented to the near future, and Hebrew is oriented to lessons of history. Greek, change is good, it's progress. Hebrew, change is bad, destruction of traditions. Hmm, never think about that. I was raised that change is good. <laughs> huh? Progress is good. Greek, universe evolved by chance. Hebrew, universe created by God. Greek, material goods equal measure of personal achievement. Hebrew, material goods equal measure of God's blessings. How many of us, and I, I'll talk about myself, have people in our lives that their material is their world? It's their wealth. They don't have anything else. That's all they talk about. And yet, the Hebrew is that what we have or don't have is God's blessing. Greek, blind faith. Hebrew, knowledge faith faced. Greek, a split between the natural and the supernatural. Hebrew, the supernatural affects everything. Greek, freedom orientation. Hebrew, security orientation. Where's my security? Here's my security. It's what's written in the Word of God. Greek, competition is good. Hebrew, competition is evil. Cooperation is better. I was raised that, you know, I work for myself, I still do a lot, is that as a builder in construction, I would never help another builder <laughs> because it was my competition. Take away from my table. Right? But I found out that cooperation, I've learned, is better. We would grow bigger. But that's the way I was raised. You know, keep climbing up that ladder. Uh, think about yourself and your family. No one else. Not really. Mm. Greek, man-centered universe. Hebrew, God, tribe, family-centered universe. Greek, worth of person based on money, material, possessions, and power. Hebrew, derived from family relationship. So we, we, we start looking at this mindset that's different. This, is, this Hebrew mindset is going to start taking us into what's written in Scripture so that we can see what we read come alive and be fulfilled today. I think that most of the church and all of my upbringing is that Got rid of the old because it's old. And only think of the new. That's a Western mindset. Because it should just be one scroll rolled up together. And then we wouldn't have that division. If you have a Bible, and, and, and maybe you do, you can open it up and see if there's a blank page between the old and the new. If there is, rip it out because it's a wall of hostility. 
It's a division that goes into your mind that you're not even thinking of. You don't even, it's just in your book and you think it separates. But it's so hidden that it divides you from the old. It keeps you away from that. And that it's so important to go back because I think all of us know what's written in Genesis 1 and 1. Why do we think it's old then? It's still relevant today to go back and tell us the story of salvation from the beginning to the end. Hmm? That we don't look at it that way and let's come out of that so that we can see what I'm going to try to show you today, building on faith and trust, understanding to get us out of that Greek mindset into the Hebrew mindset so that we can see. What I say we can see is because I believe that for everybody here that's listening to this today, and for those that are listening to it on Facebook and on YouTube later on, is that something will activate inside of you so that you go share what I'm sharing today. Because that's what will open this up for the house of Israel to recognize who their identity is. Now, I was raised that, to be Christ-like, that Christ is my identity. But my identity goes all the way back to Abraham and the blessings of Abraham. And we'll look at some of that today to see that that word that is spoken of, especially in Deuteronomy, is coming to life today. So, I wanted to share about um, the, uh, called a theocratic state, in that... A theocratic state is really one of perfectness. And it's not, it's not one of being controlled by man. And as I was reading uh, out of the story of Silto Saxon Israel and uh, Mr. Bennett, there's a piece in here that talks about With God as its king and the actual head of its garment, a government, excuse me, with God as its king and the actual head of its government, and with its people living and conducting their affairs in obedience to his will and his laws, Israel effectually became the kingdom of God on earth. And you think, what, what does that mean? But if we go back and we read from when the Israelites were just getting ready to go into Israel, and Joshua is going to lead them in, and we go through the book of Judges, we can see that they were living as God as their lawgiver and their king, and there were people that enforced his law. It was the kingdom of God on earth. It's a picture of the kingdom of God on earth. So... The disciples asked Yeshua, how do we pray? He says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So he's showing you a picture right then that God's word that's written in scripture before man became a king, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Does that make sense? <laughs> It only makes sense if we understand what is written there because once a king comes in, the king will rule and make laws over you that you do not want. Now, we look at a, a, an older ancient map, we will see Israel and we will see all these different kingdoms with a man's name on them around Israel. But God's kingdom was perfect right there at that time. So when we're praying the Lord's Prayer and asking for His kingdom to come, we don't even know what it looks like. How can we look at what it looks like that we think is in heaven when it's already a picture on earth and we're not doing it? This is again trying to get us to, to get out of this Greek mindset into a Hebrew mindset and said, all these laws, all these commandments that the Father told Moses to write down are for your blessings. They're for your good. They're to live in harmony, learn how to live in harmony with each other. And then when you step out, there's a, a parliament or a government that enforces the law, but doesn't make laws. They're not making laws. They're only following what's written in your Bible. That's the picture of the kingdom of God on earth. How do we get back to that? 
Now, I know Judah doesn't rule that way today because I think there's a lot of other things that Judah's saying that doesn't need to be said and doing that doesn't need to be done. But for the most part, they're trying to keep it together. So I want to look at that picture of what it looks like so that when we work on reconciliation, I know what I'm talking about with Judah. That's so important, excuse me, for them to see that because then they will know. But it's the same part I think that we look at a little bit with Jacob when he sees Joseph's sons yeah. for the first time. Who are these? We, my wife and I have been to Israel to see this. Who are these? Hmm? You're talking like we know you, but you don't look like we know you. <laughs> huh? So we're trying to build this relationship and get out of this thinking here and into this thinking here. Hope I didn't shake it up too much. Hmm? Any questions? No? No thoughts? So we're trying to move to that. I think that when I asked, you know, and, and Rabbi offered to let me share with this a few weeks ago, and I thought, what, how, what, what am I going to share? And this is what the Lord kept telling me to try to share, to get us to how another way to think and get to what's written in Scripture. And for myself, when I started, first started learning this, it isn't an overnight thing. It takes practice. How do you practice praying three times a day if you've never done it? You just start. That's all you do. How do you observe Shabbat if you've never done it, if you weren't raised that way? You just start. Right? With all the feast, you just start. And people would, would get into the part of, well, you're under the law. Well, let me tell you, everybody's under the law. We're all under a law. You know, if it wasn't for the law of physics, your chair wouldn't work today. You'd be sitting on the floor. So we're all under a law. The law is good for us. The commandments, the word of God are, is, is good for us. So I don't want anybody to think that we're going to start practicing praying three times a day or becoming Shabbat observant. And then you miss one day and you condemn yourself because we don't live under condemnation. Hmm? We live under that part of grace that we get up and we do it again and we just start and we do it again and the more we do it the deeper my heart becomes closer with my father and start showing us this is what he wants is for you to come home so when we look we'll go to the next slide here and I, I'm going backwards okay here's a picture of Israel's borders that were promised to Abraham. Huh? It's, it, it's not this one. Nope. Huh? Don't get caught up in this Greek mindset that, that says that's Israel. Huh? Because this is man right now. Even though God did a miraculous thing 70 years ago and all of a sudden it becomes a nation again. It's absolute miracle. But God's word does not return void, does it? So it's not this one. This is more of the picture of what God promised Abraham. Amen. Hmm? So we might be thinking, how is the house of Israel going to return to that little piece of land right there? <laughs> it won't. It'll be, God will do a miraculous thing again and it will become this big. Genesis 15 and 18. On, in that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Exodus 23 and 31. And I will set thy border from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Numbers 34 and 6. As for the western border, you shall have the great sea for a border. This shall be your western border, the Mediterranean. Deuteronomy 11 and 24. Every place whereon the sole of your foot shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the hinder sea shall be your border. Joshua 1 and 4. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your border. Where does the sun set? In the west. 
over the Mediterranean. Here's a, a, let's get out of that picture there and get into this picture here that Israel looks like. Hmm? I know we've all, I'm, I, I'm one of them. This is all I knew for a long time. How many times do we read scripture and picture Israel looking like that? Hmm? This is a mindset, because I can look at people right now and see you're looking at it. Huh? This is, I want, this is what we want imprinted in here, not that. Yes? I guess I was reading in Jeremiah 47, where it said that all tribes of Israel are going to spread out, you know, and establish. I think it's going to be in the center of the Joshua is going to be at that place. Mm -hmm. And spread out all the 12 tribes in Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem is right about here, so Yeshua will be reigning from the temple here, and this is the current borders of Israel, the small little strip that you see over there. Mm -hmm. But this is the original amount of land that God promised Abraham for the regathering of all of Israel in the Millennial Kingdom. So this is what's going to be when, in the age of Mashiach, when Mashiach comes. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Do you think he's going to be part of us, um, Egypt too? And yes. Oh yeah. Egypt. Yes. So, he said from the Nile, which is here, that's why this border is drawn, and then to the Euphrates, which is to the north, mm -hmm. and to the west, the setting of the sun, and to this river, which you can see, Euphrates comes all the way down and empties into the Persian Gulf. So you literally have these border lines. And also the Bible God. and the Revelation mention of the four rivers. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. So as we're getting this new mindset going on and we're talking about reconciliation between the house of Israel and the house of Judah, we have to see what God promised that when he regathers, this will be the borders. How is this going to happen? This is what a Greek mindset will tell you. I don't know. How can it happen? That's what the seventh plague is all about. It's all about <laughs> crush all the kingdoms of the earth and prepare it for Mashiach. And he will and God will perform it. He has the Father I believe has this calling on my life and others today to share this with everyone that I can so you can see the borders expanding. Now if I was going to buy a piece of property in another country, I would be looking at buying it out here because it's probably pretty cheap. <laughs> huh? Start building homes out here because it's going to get fulfilled. It's going to happen. And I believe it'll happen in our lifetime. I don't think this is so far out that you're not going to see it. Who has land they have to share with us? <laughs> it to, it, it's, it's the Father's land that he promised Abraham. Huh? What about the original uh, piece of land that they were uh, um, uh, to conquer? Is that, uh, they never did fulfill. They never fulfilled. Yeah. Because of the devil. Remember, he had to make Abraham seed like the stars of the heaven. So we have multiplied in all the lands of our dispersion. And this original land grant that he promised Abraham was for the fulfillment after the multiplication of Israel. So it'll only be in the last days that Israel fully fulfills that whole area. It hasn't ever hit the at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what I think too, Rabbi, is that God's calling us out today. He's calling you out to return back home, which is return to the original, return to the Father. So that when we start coming, and this is, I think, part of what Israel recognizes today, the house of Judah and Israel recognizes today, is that there's so many of us wanting to come back that they have to protect, they have to protect their borders today and tradition. I'm going to show this later on about tradition, how tradition is so important. They have to protect it, or it will get overrun by others that aren't of us. That would bring corruption and paganism back into the land. Yeah, and so as we get called back, you know, I would I would look at how how does this how does this look like for us to be returning back? And my friend Charlie Pope shares with me that in the days of Noah. And, and Yeshua talks about this. In the end days, it'll be like the days of Noah. 
So I believe that we can see it's like that today. There, the, the world is upside down with chaos and they're breaking the law, it's lawlessness that there is being rampant. So how will this happen if it's in the, la in the last days that are the days like Noah? Noah didn't go out and get the animals to come back to the ark. God called them and they all came. So it's the same thing today. The Father is calling you to come back. Nobody's going to go get you and bring you back. It's the Spirit of God that will speak to you. And when that gets activated, then you'll know it's you that has to return. That's my, that's my, my look on that. So we look at this, and then the borders will get expanded. God will do it, just miraculously like he did in 1948 when Israel became a nation. He will do something again. It's our Western mindset that I'm trying to get us to come out of, to look at what His Word, God's Word says, so that you can come out and see it fulfilled in your life today. Here's a picture of David's kingdom. And, it's, and, and, and I'll read this to you because it, it's scriptural. 1 Chronicles 18 and 3. And David smote Hadarezer, king of Zobah, by Hamath, and he went to establish his dominion at the river Euphrates. 2 Samuel 8 and 3. David smote also Hadarezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, and he went to establish his dominion at the river of the Euphrates. And 2 Kings 5 and 1. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river unto the land of the Philistines and unto the border of Egypt and they brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. So we can look at right here and see how big David's kingdom was and Solomon ruled the same kingdom. This is just the kingdom here. This doesn't even have the kingdom out here on it. So, so when we read scripture, do we see what this picture is of how big David's kingdom was? Or do we just think David's kingdom was Israel? This picture. Hmm? Don't you think that if David's kingdom was this big, that God is going to expand this kingdom to what he told, promised Abraham? This Old Testament is not old. It's being fulfilled today in our lives in your lives it is being fulfilled so that when this happens it will happen miraculously and be huge it will be fulfilled so that you're part of it yes I don't think so I think it only got this big Yes, if it you know, covered all that big space. I don't, I don't believe it did. No. But we can start seeing that how big David's kingdom was. We can see the borders that the father promised Abraham and that it has to be fulfilled. His word will not return void and it's going to be fulfilled from you. Hallelujah coming together to see this happen. I love that picture. I, you know, I know that came from, uh, I believe, uh, Ovadia. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at that and said, we need to show this. Romans 10 and 17. So faith comes by hearing, Shammai, and hearing by the word of God. Jacob 1, 22 and 20. Five, be doers of the word and not only hearers, deluding your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he sees himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law, the Torah, the law of freedom, and continues not being a hearer who forgets but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. <coughs> Faith is not only the result of having heard, but of having listened with an attitude of willingness to obey what it said. Faith that does not develop in a person who only reads the scriptures, not bothering to practice what is taught. He who has an ear, let him hear, let him do what he has heard. Faith does not develop in a person who only reads the scriptures, not bothering to practice what is taught. That speaks to me. That's why I'm standing here tonight. Hmm? 
I hear it and I'm sharing what I've heard. That's all. I have to step out and do what I've heard. I can't just read it and think that that's faith. Hmm? And it's not comfortable. In, it's never been comfortable for me to do what I'm doing right here. It shouldn't be. <laughs> but it's the faith that I have to share it, that you all have it. You all have it. But whether you do it is up to you. Hmm? Deuteronomy 4 and 1. Now, Israel, listen to the statutes and to the ordinances which I teach you to do them, that you may live and go in peace, go in and possess the land which Hashem, the God of your fathers, gives you. The Hebrew word for listen is Shemai, and we, we, we read that today, we sang it, this proclamation. So Shemai is the first thing that man must do in order to be near the eternal, is to listen and obey. Hashem, Ha and Shem. Shem means the name. The name is what destroys chaos. If you have chaos in your life, it's telling us right here how to get rid of it. It's the name, yod heh vah -Heh, that destroys chaos. And here Shemai means to see the name Obey, Shemai means to see the name, and understand, Shemai means to see the name. Do we see the name, or are we just speaking it? Do we believe what's written in Scripture when we read it is seeing the name? The seeing the name will destroy chaos, and you will, it will come into your life. It isn't just reading to believe. It's believing to see. How do we get to see that? Through the name, the Shema'i prayer. I have to read that part of it again to us today because it goes deeper in here too as we look at this part. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart. He commands us to do them, and where will they be? They'll be on our hearts. What he says up here, let's see. Now, Israel, listen to the statutes and to the ordinance which I teach you. To the, now, Israel, Shmai, listen. I think there's a difference between hearing and listening. You see, because I can hear other noise inside here as I'm speaking. But when somebody asks the question or a comment, I need to listen. Hmm? How many times have you, when you're raising your children, told them to go do something and they didn't do it? So you tell them again and they said, I heard you. But they didn't do it because they weren't listening. See that difference? Hmm? To listen to what God has to say is going to bring this into your life. It tells me here to, uh, they'll be upon your heart, teach them repeatedly to your children, speaking of them when you sit at home and when you travel around the, on the way. Bind them on a, as a sign on your hand and they shall be an emblem between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and gates. Upon your heart. And so out of Song of Teshuvah, the Rabbi uh, Menachem Mendel, the Kotzer Rabbi, asks, why does the verse state upon your heart? It should say, in your heart. The answer is often that a person's heart is too hard to accept these words. They're always there, but the heart is not able to receive them. But when the heart cracks, the words fall in. So we start teaching and sharing about wanting to come back to Judah and do what Judah has always been doing. We start practicing the feasts, the Shabbat, eating kosher, all, all the pieces. And it's so hard because our heart is still hasn't received it. It's sitting there. But then the day comes where it cracks and it goes in and you go, oh, I get it. And you want to do it. 
Not that you have to. You'll want to do it. We stop that rebellion of no, I don't want to and get to yes, I want to do it. Because you can't stop the heartfelt feeling that God has put in there. You can't stop it. You can fight it all your life and it'll be a struggle. But until we can recognize to see the name and know that it destroys that chaos, your heart opens up, it comes inside and you get closer to your Creator than you've ever been before. I'm hoping that part of that message tonight that I'm sharing will get us to that place so that we can see the reconciliation of the two houses. I want to share about part of Torah One New Man is that we have an initiative called, called the, the Masusa Initiative of 5778 and it's Restoring God's Commandments. And Natalie Blackman writes, uh, The Beauty of the Hebrew Language. The masseuse is a small rectangular box, usually made of wood or metal, which is placed at an angle on the right side of the doorpost of a Jewish home. It is inscribed with the Hebrew letter Shin, the symbol for God, sometimes the entire name Shaddai, using the letters Shin, Dalet, and Yod. Interesting, these letters are an acronym for Shomer, Dalot, Yisrael, which means the guardian of the doors of Israel. The masseuse contains a cloth or parchment which, describe, which a scribe has written by the hand of the Hebrew words of the Shemai, the commandment of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and 11, 20 through 21. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart. Teach them repeatedly to your children, speaking of them when you sit at home and when you travel on the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be an emblem between your eyes. Write them on the doorpost of your house and gates. It also says in 11 and 12, 11, 20, and 21, write them on the doorpost of your house and gates so that you and your children may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them, for as long as the heavens are above the earth. As far as I know, the heavens are still above the earth. So this word is being fulfilled today, still. Masusa means doorpost. It reminds every observant Jew to abide in the word of God to pass it on to future generations. It reminds the Jews of God's protection through the ages, like Psalms 121 and 8. The Lord will watch over you in your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Yeshua said, I am the gate for the sheep, John 10 and 7. Yeshua, like the shepherd, protects the gates of the sheep pen. He is the only way to the Father. I am the way, no one comes to the Father except through me. After the fall, when Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, God placed cherubim on either side of the eastern entrance and a flaming sword turning every which way to guard the way to the tree of life. It's a guardian. Exodus 12, 21 and 23. God instructed the Israelites to put blood on the top of the sides of the door frames of their houses for protection when the angel of death struck the firstborn. Jewish people remember this deliverance in the Passover feast every year. These examples show the spiritual significance of gateways and the importance of the Masusa as a reminder of God's word and his protection for those who are obedient and following his ways. As believers, we have the responsibility to guard the entrance places to our homes and of our lives. Entrances are where evil spirits can enter if you have no guardian. Part of our initiative for Torah One New Man, it's on our website also, is to restore God's commandments to every household in our state and nation. We help support the land of Israel and honor the Jewish people. We bring these masseuses home with us. And so it's made out of olive wood. It shows King David's tower. It says Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Hebrew. It has the shin on it, which is, stands for Shaddai. And so our support with Israel is that uh, one person I bought this from is supported their business. Who are, the, the person that made it in Bethlehem, which is probably a Muslim, supported their business. And when we sell these for $10 each, we send 20% back to another business or ministry in Israel. And so 
we made them so that we have them so that you could put a little scroll in there of the Ten Commandments. Our initiative is to put one million of these on every on the million homes in the United States. And my wife's going around to give everyone one of these to take home today. Oh, thank you, brother. We want it on your house. We want you to recognize that this, the masseuse, is the guardian of your house. It keeps you protected from evil spirits coming in. That's what, how they do this. And it's written right there in the Shemaiah. Are we following the commandments to put these on the houses? You have one to take home today. And it's important that we can do that to get eventually one million on every home. Yes? Pardon me? No, they're not kosher. <laughs> But they do have our blessing. We have the blessing of the Father on them. We say thank you for the Muslim that made that come into their life today. Let them know that you are their Messiah. You are their salvation. That's a good way to help remember to pray for them as well. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this part of seeing the name in the Shema, when we read it, when we say it morning and evening, is more than just reading it to try to go deeper in that understanding is that shmai means to hear obey understand is to see the name see it when you are reading it not just reading it and performing something by rote touch, let it touch our heart the next one is tashuvu which is means in hebrew it means you shall return and well, I know that this month of Elul is a month of repentance. So Teshuvah ta is repentance. Tashuvu is you shall return. So repenting without returning it doesn't really mean a whole lot except for maybe you did something that makes you feel good. Because what will happen is that you'll go back to what you used to do anyways. It doesn't go away. The repentance are just the words. But to turn around from what you are doing and go the other way is you shall return. And what are you returning to? You're returning to the original, to the Father. You're returning back to Him because we've turned and walked away. So we have the, we have the, the Tav, the Shin, the Vait, and the Vav, which has a numerical value. Each letter is a numerical value in Gematria. And so I wanted to share this today because I think it is important too, is that the, the numerical value adds up to 708 of the, of the words. You have the Tav 400, the Shin 300, the Vait uh, 200, and the Vav 6, 2. Excuse me, yeah, not 200. So we came up to a 708. If I add the millennial year 5,000 that we're in, we're at 5,708. And if we convert it to the secular year we are in, it comes to 1948. Amen. The year that God destined that we should return to the land. Mm -hmm. The year that Israel became a nation again. And when, ha because we're in that time frame here of returning, then we can look at Deuteronomy 30 and 5. Deuteronomy 30 and 5 says, And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you will possess it. And he will do good for you and multiply you above your fathers. That verse is the verse number 5,708 in Scripture. <laughs> Now, I don't think God is a God of coincidences. Huh? I think he has a perfect plan rolled out and laid out for us, and he wants us to learn and go deeper. So we, I would have never learned this without others sharing it with me. I can't share anything that others haven't taught, right? But it starts bringing us closer together to say, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Well, think about who our Father is, how big our God is. There's nothing new under the sun. So this was all written out in your scriptures way before it ever happened. Okay. All right. 
Deuteronomy 4 and 30. When you are in oppression and all these things are come on you, in the latter days you shall return to Hashem your God and listen to his voice. 4 and 31. For Hashem your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which, we, which he swore to them. This is part of what's happening today in the earth. That God is calling us out to return. Where it is, is at the latter days. And then we shall return to Hashem our God, your God, and listen to his voice. Everybody has the ability to hear his voice. To me, it's in my heart. It's not a loud, audible voice. It speaks to me in my heart. And I believe that's how he does it to everybody. Some people may hear some, I don't know. But to me, it's here. And then it needs to get activated so that we can return to him, listen and obey the words of the Torah, and we will experience his compassion and faithfulness and covenant that was sworn to our fathers, our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and, and Yaakov. Deuteronomy 7 and 9, Therefore that Hashem your God, he is the God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and loving kindness with them who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations keeps his commandments to a thousand generations. There haven't been a thousand generations on planet Earth yet. Okay, Deuteronomy 1 and 10. Hashem your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as the stars of the sky for the multitude. Hashem, your, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. At this time, Moshe is, is speaking to the Israelites. They're getting ready to go into Israel. And there's probably about 600,000 of them fighting men. And if we add a wife and one and a half children, we'll come up with about 1.8 million people. And if God promised that he will multiply them by a thousand times. It tells us that there will be at least two billion of them. With almost eight billion people on planet Earth today, that's 25% being called out that will be blessed to return to the land. Hmm? That's how that border will expand. Because this size of Israel on the map today will not hold two, two billion people. But the promised land of Abraham will. Hmm? This isn't Old Testament. This is scripture being fulfilled today in your lifetime. My goal is for us to get to that mindset to see it happening. Not to go, how can that happen? There's things that are written in Scripture that we don't know how it's going to happen, but it will happen. He promised Abraham that it would. When I talked about our returning to the original, returning to the Father, and the restoration of all things, is Acts 3, 17 to 21. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your leaders did. But what God foretold through the mouth of all his prophets that his Messiah was to suffer, so he has fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and return, so your sins might be blotted out, so times of relief might come from the presence of Adonai, and he might send Yeshua the Messiah appointed for you. Heaven must receive him until the time of restoration of all things that God spoke about long ago through the mouth of his holy prophets. He cannot return until it's all restored back to the original, that what the prophets talked about has to be restored. And it is our part to be that, help out that kingdom to come. We can't just sit here and think and wait. Come, Lord, come. He won't do it. And if you don't do it, he'll use someone else. You have a part in the kingdom to come. 
And this goes right back into how he multiplied this by a thousand in Deuteronomy. And there's scripture throughout all of it, all of the prophecies that tell us about the scattering and the regathering. I don't, I'm not, wasn't going there tonight. My job was to get to, to try to believe a different way and see it through a different lens than we have before. Until all things are restored, Messiah will not return. But time is going back like this, okay? Because I believe in the six days will end and we'll move into the seventh day. Even thinking about the year 57, 78, moving into 79, does not mean that there are 221 years left before the end. Unfortunately, man doesn't know how to count. He just doesn't do a very good job. Going all the way back to Moses on the, on the Mount Sinai the first time, when he didn't return, what'd they do? They built a golden calf. Huh? Because they didn't know how to count to 40 days. They missed it by one day. So if they missed it by one day, we can sure miss it by a couple hundred years. Huh? But the restoration of all things is happening at lightning speed. Do we believe that, this, that, that time is going faster than ever before? I do too. I think most of us do. Everybody I talk to sees time speeding up quicker and quicker. So another way to look at this is how fast it goes is that there's a, a, a Jewish scientist, and I didn't bring his name, I'm sorry, that's written on the, seven, the six days of creation because they were one day. But the first day was probably 8 billion years in our mindset, right? Stretched out. We can't, we can't even imagine what a billion is, yet alone 8. But the second day was half that at 4 billion. And the next day was half of that at 2 billion. And the next day was half of that at 1. And the next day was half at a half a billion, and then a quarter of a billion. So it puts us at about 15,750,000 years today, which lines up with science. How old the earth is? 15 to 20 billion years. But you see how time gets cut in half every day? So it's going faster and faster. So our mindset can't tell us 220 years, we won't be here. But 220 years could go that quick. Because when this gets restored and the fullness of the Gentiles come in, which I believe is us, then all of Israel will be saved, the borders will be expanded, and we will be returning. Now maybe we all can't return physically, but you can already start the process spiritually. And many of us will return physically because that's our heart's desire. Zechariah 8 and 23. In those days it will happen that ten people of all the languages of the nations will take hold of the corner of a garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This is being fulfilled today. And I'm proof of it, because I'll share it. I have, when we go, to my, my wife and I go to Israel and meet new people, and the ones we met, we go back and see every trip to make deeper connections, is that I have a Jewish friend in the Jewish quarter in the old city. His name's Yosef. And he has a weaving store where they hand weave the most beautiful tallits on planet Earth. And I go see Yosef last year, and I have a picture of it. I only have a kippah on. And Yosef says, maybe next time you'll be wearing zitzit. <laughs> See, so he recognizes the house of Israel returning. And this is proof that they start seeing. It, and commandment, we read this in the Shemai too, so it tells us to wear it. It's not just for the Jew, right? It's for everyone to wear. So they start recognizing us, us coming back. And that's what it says right here. In the latter days, in those days, it, they will... Everybody's going to want to come and take hold of that tzitzit. Teach us. Amos 9 and 9. For behold, I decree that I will shake out the house of Israel among all the nations, as grain is shaken in a sieve, and not a pebble falls to the ground. Just as large items do not fall through the seas, so the house of Israel, though they will be shaken from place to place, will never fall to the ground completely. With all the scattering around the world, we are still here fulfilling God's word around the world. Zechariah 10 and 16. I will strengthen the house of Yehuda, and I will save the house of Yosef, and I will bring them back, for I have mercy on them, and they will be as though I had not cast them off. 
for I am Hashem their God, and I will hear them. Ephraim will be like a mighty man, and their heart will rejoice as through wine. Yes, their children will rejoice. Will, yes, their children will see it and rejoice. Their heart will be glad in Hashem. I will signal for them. Here's the signal going on today. I will gather them. He's gathering them today, for I have redeemed them, and they will increase as they have increased. I will sow them among the peoples, and they will remember me in far countries. And they will live with their children and will return. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt. It's time to come out and gather them out of Ashur, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and there won't be enough room for them. Go back to that map that they showed of the promise of Abraham. There still won't be enough room for them. <coughs> the land of Gilead is part of what is today called Jordan, and Lebanon is Lebanon. And here is yet another prophecy declaring that the children of Israel will, in the last days, possess the areas on the eastern side of the river Yarden. Not all of Israel is Jewish. Only Judah and Benjamin. Judah holds the scepter. Joseph holds the birthright. Judah preserved the scripture. Joseph spread the scripture. Judah goes to the sages, and the church goes to their traditions. Hmm. Just a little bit to think about. We know, we know that Judah holds a scepter that was given through Jacob to when he when he blessed Judah, and Joseph holds the birthright when Jacob blessed Joseph and gave the birthright to Ephraim and Manasseh. Both of those are so important because the firstborn would usually receive both blessings. But here was that separation. But this is. What needs to be returned? Judah and Joseph. That's the return. This will bring family back together. Hmm? Judah and Joseph were brothers. Brothers of Jacob. Hmm? Has to return. It has to happen. What about Yeshua? Yeshua is central. Yeshua was a Torah-observant Jew. In fact, he was completely righteous, obeying all of the Torah as it applied to him. That's what it means when we say that he is sinless. Christians are called to be Christ-like. Yeshua said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Luke 6 and 40. He taught us that he had not come to counsel the Torah, but to fulfill it. When we study the Torah, in many ways we are studying Yeshua. He was and is the Word made flesh. We study Torah because it begins and ends with Yeshua. We desire to teach Torah because he was a Torah teacher. We desire to understand the commandments because he lived them out. Thus they reveal his character and inform us of what it means to be a faithful disciple. Yeshua didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. Yeshua didn't come to destroy the Torah, but to obey it. I'll leave that there just for a second, because now I have to read something out of today's weekly Torah parasha out of Shoftim. We will get a little bit in on it. Hmm? Judges, Deuteronomy 17 and 3. And has gone out and served other gods and worshipped them, or the sun, or the moon, or any of the host of the sky, which I have not commanded. The Torah forbids astrology. Do not read horoscopes. Do not worship the heavens. The heavens declare the glory. Study them so that we can see what God planted in the heavens, made in the heavens, the story of salvation come alive in your life. There's lots of good books out there to read this because it's all written in the scriptures, especially in the Psalms. It talks about the heavens and it tells us this story. So we look at the, the heavens today and, and see the, the story of the scales of Virgo. It is the, right now the month of justice. A judgment. It's a month of judgment. 
and there's other parts of it too but I had to share that because this is the one that that gets me 21 and 1 If anyone be found slain in the land, which Hashem your God gives you to possess it, lying in the field, and it isn't known who has struck him. Here we see the weight that Hashem places on the shedding of innocent blood. A murder is something very serious. Hearing news about the violent death of one single person ought to shake us. The judicial process that is commanded here has the purpose of making sure that this blood does not bring a curse over the land of the people. If there is anything that brings a curse over the people or over land, it is the shedding of innocent blood. Hashem considers it very serious. Therefore, it is something to be very serious with us as well. Any idea about the shedding of innocent blood in America? It's abortion. If you don't stand up and do something for it, about it, God will not tolerate it. It is a time of judgment. I'm sorry, but it is a time of judgment on this nation. And it happens to be today that we read this, but it's shedding of innocent blood. Hmm? He will not tolerate it. And so it's time for us to return back to the Father. It's time for us to stop doing what we've been doing and going on as life is normal and return back to Him. The days are at, at the end. I believe it in all my heart that it's at the very end. And this is a piece of it that unfortunately in America, over 50 million babies have been killed. And it should touch everybody's heart. It has to stop. God forgive us. I know last week you asked if I wanted to <clears throat> share on anything, and <laughs> that's the part I got, but I, that's the only part I wanted to share on today because it touches my heart. It's about returning. <clears throat> We're going to end with this one here. Covenant renewed. Jeremiah 31, 30, and 33. Behold, the days are coming, the word of Hashem, when I will seal a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I sealed with the forefathers on the day that I took the hold of their hand to take them out of the land of Egypt. For they abrogated my covenant, although I became their master. The word of Hashem, for this is the covenant that I shall seal with the house of Israel after those days. The word of Hashem. I will place my Torah within them, and I will write it into their hearts. I will be a God for them, and they will be a people for me. They will no longer teach each man his fellow, each man his brother, saying, No Hashem, for all of them will know me, from their smallest to their greatest, the word of Hashem, when I will forgive their iniquity and will no longer recall their sin. I believe the Father has put the Torah into your heart already, and you already know it. But because we are, we have hardened hearts, and we really don't, like to be disciplined we don't do what he says to do but he's already put it in there and once this gets activated inside of you and i believe in my prayers that it happened tonight is that you will never be the same again that you will realize what's written from all of the holy prophets has to be fulfilled before messiah can return and with that, thank you very much. Thank you for the time, Rabbi Yitzhak. Lord bless you and keep you. May his shalom be upon you always. May your families be prosperous. May your hearts be softened. May they be cracked so that the word can fall into them, that you will know his truth. And it's the truth that will set you free. Amen, amen and amen. Thank you.